Alléluia, le Christ est ressuscité. Il est, Il vraiment, est vraiment ressuscité. ressuscité. Alléluia. Alléluia. Bienvenue à la petite église française du Saint-Esprit pour notre dimanche des Huguenots. Bienvenue aux membres du euh, Huguenot Society and the Holland Society et nos visiteurs internationaux. Euh, le bulletin se trouve sur la première page de notre site web ou juste en dessous de notre chaîne YouTube, euh, inclut les cantiques et le serment quand le moment arrive. Welcome to the Little French Church of Saint-Esprit for our annual celebration of the promulgation of the Edict of Nantes, our uh, anniversary of Huguenot Sunday. Uh, welcome to the members of the Huguenot Society who are joining us this morning, and to the Holland Society also, since we'll be singing a little in Dutch uh, and remembering some of that foundation of our story too. And welcome also to our international visitors this morning. Welcome to New York and the Little French Church of Saint-Esprit. Chantons ensemble notre premier cantique, à Front von Rudi Heid. Uh, the first verse we will sing in Dutch and the other verses in French.
Prions Dieu. Mettons-nous humblement en la présence de Dieu, qui remplit de sa majesté toutes choses, qui nous voit et entend en ce lieu, étant présent par son essence, puissance et bonté à toutes ses créatures, et que nous devons sentir en nous et hors de nous, par foi et par amour, en toutes choses. Amen. Amen. Le Seigneur soit avec vous. Et avec toi aussi. Prions. Ô oh Dieu, toi dont le Fils Jésus est le bon pasteur de ton peuple, accorde-nous, en entendant sa voix, de connaître celui qui nous appelle chacun et chacune par notre nom et de le suivre là où il nous conduit. Lui qui vit et règne avec toi et le Saint-Esprit, un seul Dieu pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Amen. Asseyez-vous, s'il vous plaît, pour notre première lecture. Please be seated for our first reading. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 5 to 12. Notre première lecture est tirée des Actes des Apôtres, chapitre 4, versets 5 à 12. Le lendemain, les dirigeants, les anciens et les spécialistes des Écritures s'assemblèrent à Jérusalem. Il y avait en particulier Anne, le grand prêtre, Caïphe, Jean, Alexandre et tous les membres de la famille du grand prêtre. Ils firent amener les apôtres devant eux et leur demandèrent « Par quel pouvoir ou au nom de qui avez-vous fait cela ?» Pierre, rempli de l'Esprit Saint, leur dit « Chef du peuple et ancien, on nous interroge aujourd'hui à propos du bienfait à un infirme. On nous demande comment cet homme a été guéri. Eh bien, sachez-le, vous tous, ainsi que tout le peuple d'Israël. Si cet homme se présente devant vous en bonne santé, c'est par le pouvoir du nom de Jésus-Christ de Nazareth 
celui que vous avez crucifié et que Dieu a ressuscité des morts. Jésus est la pierre que vous, les bâtisseurs, avez rejetée et qui est devenue la pierre d'angle. Le salut se trouve uniquement en lui, car nulle part dans le monde, il n'a été donné aux êtres humains quelqu'un d'autre par qui nous pourrions être sauvés. Parole du Seigneur. Nous, nous rendons grâce à Dieu. Levons-nous pour chanter ensemble notre prochain cantique qui est un psaume, le psaume 23, L'Éternel seul est mon berger. Let's sing together psaume 23. Asseyez-vous, s'il vous plaît, pour notre première lecture, deuxième lecture. Please be seated for a second reading. La première épître de Jean, chapitre 3, versets 16 à 24. The first letter to John, of John, chapter 3, verse 16 to 24. Voici comment nous savons ce qu'est l'amour. Jésus-Christ a donné sa vie pour nous. Nous aussi, nous devons donner notre vie pour nos frères et nos sœurs. Si quelqu'un a les moyens de vivre et voit son frère ou sa sœur dans le besoin, mais lui ferme son cœur, comment peut-il prétendre qu'il aime Dieu Mes enfants, 
N'aimons pas seulement en parole, avec de beaux discours. Faisons preuve d'un véritable amour qui se manifeste par des actes. Voilà comment nous saurons que nous appartenons à la vérité. Voilà comment notre cœur pourra se sentir rassuré devant Dieu. En effet, même si notre cœur nous accuse, nous savons que Dieu est plus grand que notre cœur et qu'il connaît tout. Et si, très chers amis, notre cœur ne nous accuse pas, nous avons de l'assurance devant Dieu. Ce que nous lui demandons, nous le recevons de lui parce que nous obéissons à ses commandements et que nous faisons ce qui lui plaît. Voici ce qu'il nous commande. C'est que nous croyons au nom de son Fils Jésus-Christ et que nous nous aimions les uns les autres, comme le Christ nous l'a ordonné. Celui qui obéit au commandement de Dieu demeure en Dieu et Dieu demeure en lui. Voici comment nous savons que Dieu demeure en nous. C'est grâce à son Esprit qu'il nous a donné. Parole du Seigneur nous, nous rendons grâce, grâce à, à Dieu. Dieu. Chantons ensemble notre prochain cantique, Il me conduit. Let's sing together our next hymn, Il, nous, Il me conduit.
Le Saint-Évangile selon Jean, chapitre 10, versets 11 à 18. Moi, je suis le bon berger. Le bon berger donne sa vie pour ses moutons. Celui qui ne travaille que pour de l'argent n'est pas vraiment le berger. Les moutons ne lui appartiennent pas. Il les abandonne et s'enfuit quand il voit venir le loup. Et le loup se jette sur les moutons, il disperse le troupeau. Cet homme ne travaille que pour de l'argent et ne se soucie pas des moutons. Moi, je suis le bon berger, je connais mes moutons et ils me connaissent, de même que le Père me connaît et que je connais le Père, et je donne ma vie pour mes moutons. J'ai encore d'autres moutons qui n'appartiennent pas à cet enclos. Je dois aussi les conduire. Ils écouteront ma voix, et ils deviendront un seul troupeau avec un seul berger. C'est pour cette raison que le Père m'aime, parce que je donne ma vie pour ensuite la recevoir à nouveau. Personne ne me prend la vie, mais je la donne volontairement. J'ai autorité pour la donner et j'ai l'autorité pour la recevoir à nouveau. Cela correspond au commandement que mon Père m'a donné. Évangile du Seigneur Vous, s'il vous plaît, au-dessus de cette Le sermon en français et en anglais se trouve sur la première page de notre site web ou juste, euh, juste en dessous euh, de notre chaîne YouTube. You can find an English version of the sermon and a French version of the sermon on the first page of our website or just underneath our YouTube channel. There's no version of the sermon in Dutch, unfortunately. Neither could I preach it if there was. Il y a plusieurs années, un ancien membre du consistoire de Saint-Esprit, dont je tairai le nom, m'a dit d'une façon assez franche, « Personne ne vient à Saint-Esprit pour l'architecture. » Au premier abord, j'étais un peu surpris par cette remarque. J'aime beaucoup notre sanctuaire, bien que ce ne soit pas la plus majestueuse des dix bâtiments que nous avons occupé à New York depuis notre premier office le jour de Pâques en 1628. Mais en y réfléchissant, j'ai commencé à accepter sa remarque comme un compliment. À travers les siècles, ceux qui sont devenus membres de notre petit troupeau l'ont fait pour bien des raisons, la plus importante étant celle que nous commémorons aujourd'hui. Quelles que soient les raisons qui ont mené ces personnes à croiser notre chemin ou cliquer sur le lien de notre chaîne YouTube, chacune a été guidée ici par le bon berger dont nous avons entendu parler dans la lecture de l'évangile de Jean. 
Le plus grand trésor d'une église n'est pas son bâtiment, son capital, ses ressources naturelles, aussi majestueux qu'il soit. Le plus grand trésor d'une église est les gens qui la forment. Et je ne parle pas seulement de ceux qui en sont membres aujourd'hui, je parle de ceux que le bon berger a réunis dans ce petit enclos au cours des siècles. Leurs histoires peuvent parfois rester dormantes ou oubliées pendant un temps, mais quand le moment arrive, elles nous parlent d'une façon nouvelle de leur rencontre avec le Christ, le bon berger, et elles nous inspirent à réfléchir sur la façon dont nous voulons raconter notre histoire aujourd'hui. L'une des qualités distinctes de notre sanctuaire est la collection de boucliers des membres fondateurs de notre Église qui se trouvent sur nos murs. Vous pouvez voir trois d'entre eux sur la première page du bulletin d'aujourd'hui. Au cours des années, j'ai découvert certaines des histoires qui se cachent derrière ces noms et ces boucliers colorés. Ils ont d'une certaine façon, pris vie. Aujourd'hui, nous commémorons ces familles qui étaient associées avec le mouvement labadiste. Les prières qui récitaient, les cantiques qui chantaient, les histoires qu'ils racontaient. Il y a quelque chose d'énormément réconfortant dans le fait que leur propre rencontre avec le Christ et semblable aux histoires que nos membres racontent aujourd'hui. Leur fuite face aux persécutions, leur séjour dans différents endroits et pays avant de trouver un chez-soi, leur lutte personnelle, leur joie, leur moment de réalisation de l'amour de Dieu et leur esprit de gratitude quant à leur rédemption et leur intégration au corps du Christ. En entendant ces histoires, les paroles de notre Évangile prennent vie et deviendront un seul troupeau avec un seul berger. Face à cela, le monde fragmenté dans lequel nous vivons semble parfois déconcertant de par sa diversité et sa confusion. Même au milieu d'une un, pandémie qui nous affecte tous, les réactions du monde semblent partir dans tous les sens, et celui-ci semble incapable de tenir un discours consistant ou bien même de proposer une réponse unique et réfléchie. La vie séculaire du XXIe siècle nous donne l'impression que toutes nos certitudes ont disparu. Tout est devenu relatif et, et fragmenté, et il n'y a pas de terre ferme sur laquelle nous pouvons nous tous tenir debout. Les gens me disent parfois « Je respecte ta foi, mais ce à quoi tu crois n'a aucune importance du moment que tu es sincère. » On pourrait penser que le loup est venu dans la nuit et qu'il a dispersé les moutons qui faisaient partie avant d'un troupeau uni. Comment sommes-nous appelés à répondre à ce problème de notre temps Premièrement, soyons encouragés par les histoires de nos frères et sœurs du passé. Même dans une époque qui semblait sombre, où les problèmes semblaient insurmontables, le bon berger les a menés vers une verte prairie. Notre berger continue de mettre sa vie en jeu pour son troupeau. L'amour que, que Dieu qui nous porte aujourd'hui est le même qu'il a toujours été. Le berger connaît le nom de chacun d'entre nous. Deuxièmement, nous apprenons à entendre la voix du berger d'une façon fraîche et nouvelle. La pandémie a mis en jeu 
certaines des choses que nous considérions comme acquises. Le nouveau défi auquel nous faisons face est d'insuffler notre nouvelle vie et une nouvelle espérance dans nos communautés chrétiennes. Et ce n'est qu'en entendant la voix aimante du berger qui sait où se trouve la verte prairie que nous trouverons la nourriture et la force dont nous avons besoin. Comme nous l'avons entendu, nous ne sommes pas les premiers chrétiens à faire face à ce grand défi. Il faut que cela soit fait d'une façon nouvelle à chaque génération, car notre foi n'est jamais statique ou figée. Elle n'est pas non plus fossilisée dans le passé. L'amour de Dieu transcende le temps et l'espace. Et la première épître de Jean nous dit de vivre dans cet amour. L'amour de Dieu transcende. Il nous dit que l'amour est, la, est le premier et le plus grand des commandements. Comment, comment devons-nous faire cela Il nous dit que nous devons vivre dans le Christ, imiter le Christ, devenir le Christ pour les autres. Nous faisons cela ici et maintenant. Nous imitons ceux qui ont accueilli les premiers réfugiés qui fuient des guerres de leur religion en France par la tolérance, la consolation, l'offre de guérissants et une vraie amitié durable au-dessus de nos divisions. Une amitié que nous offrons au nom de celui qui est venu pour que tous soient un. Pour conclure, je voudrais vous faire voyager un moment vers l'ancienne église huguenote à Spitalfields, au quartier est de Londres, qui est maintenant la mosquée, jamais Masjid, et la communauté bangladaise. Sur le fronton du bâtiment, les Huguenots ont placé un magnifique cadran solaire que vous pourrez voir encore aujourd'hui. Dessus, il y est inscrit une devise rappelant une ode à Horace, « Umbra sumus ». Oui, peut-être ne sommes-nous rien que des ombres, tout comme les générations qui nous ont précédés. Il peut sembler que nous sommes ici aujourd'hui, et que nous ne le serons plus demain. Mais si nous sommes vraiment les ombres, dans la lumière de qui nous tenons-nous Quel type d'ombre jetons-nous sur les générations à venir Cette saison nous rappelle que nous sommes appelés à nous tenir dans la lumière qui a découlé de la tombe vide le matin de Pâques la lumière qui découle du Christ ressuscité, le bon berger lui-même. Comme ceux qui sont venus avant nous, que la lumière du monde nous rassemble vers lui, que nous laissions comme eux des prières, des chants, des histoires qui parlent de cet amour. Amen. Amen. Récitons ensemble le symbole de Nicée. Let's say together the Nicene Creed. Nous croyons en un seul Dieu, le Père Tout-Puissant, Créateur du ciel et de la terre, de toutes les choses visibles et invisibles. Nous croyons en un seul Seigneur, Jésus-Christ, le Fils unique de Dieu, engendré du Père avant tous les siècles, 
Dieu né de Dieu, lumière né de la lumière, vrai Dieu né du vrai Dieu, engendré, non pas créé, un seul être avec le Père, et par lui tout a été fait. Pour nous et pour notre salut, il est descendu des cieux. Il s'est incarné par le Saint-Esprit en la Vierge Marie et s'est fait homme. Crucifié pour nous sous Ponce Pilate, il a souffert la Passion. Il a été mis au tombeau. Il est ressuscité le troisième jour selon les Écritures. Il est monté aux cieux. Il siège à la droite du Père et reviendra dans la gloire pour juger les vivants et les morts. Et son règne n'aura pas de fin. Nous croyons en l'Esprit Saint, qui est Seigneur et qui donne la vie, qui procède du Père et du Fils. Par le Père et le Fils, il reçoit même adoration et même gloire. Il a parlé par les prophètes. Nous croyons en l'Église, une sainte catholique et apostolique. Nous reconnaissons un seul baptême pour le pardon des péchés. Nous attendons la résurrection des morts et la vie du monde à venir. Amen. Asseyez-vous, s'il vous plaît, pour nos prières. Please be seated for prayers. Prions pour l'Église du Christ dans sa plénitude et pour le monde en disant « Seigneur Dieu, écoute nos prières. » Dieu éternel et tout-puissant, ta sainte parole nous exhorte à t'offrir des prières, des supplications et des actions de grâce pour tous les êtres vivants. Accueille ces prières que nous présentons à ta divine majesté, te suppliant d'animer sans cesse l'Église universelle de l'esprit de vérité, d'unité et de paix. Et donne à tous ceux qui confessent ton Saint Nom de s'accorder dans la vérité de ta parole sainte et de vivre dans l'unité de l'amour. Seigneur Dieu, écoute, écoute nos, nos prières. prières. Accorde ta grâce, Père Céleste, à tous les évêques et autres ministres. Nous te prions aujourd'hui pour tous les ministres des églises protestantes du Refuge et de France, pour Nigel, notre recteur, et aumônier de la Société Huguenote d'Amérique, afin que leur vie, comme leur doctrine, annonce ta parole de vérité et de vie et administre fidèlement tes saints sacrements. Seigneur Dieu, écoute, écoute nos prières. Accorde ta grâce divine à tout ton peuple, spécialement à ton assemblée, à ton troupeau, rassemblé aujourd'hui via Internet, afin que nous recevions ta parole avec humilité et respect et que nous te servions dans la justice et dans la sainteté tout au long de nos jours. Seigneur Dieu, écoute nos prières. Inspire, Seigneur, les membres de la Société Huguenote d'Amérique et de toutes les sociétés et les églises qui héritent de la mémoire de persécutions religieuses. Rends-nous dignes, Seigneur, de ces témoignages qui reflètent tes propres souffrances et celles de ton Église en tout temps et en tout lieu. Que ces souffrances nous unissent à celles et ceux qui souffrent aujourd'hui, par-delà les frontières, les races et les confessions. Nous te prions, Seigneur, de nous guider et de nous conduire par la lumière de ta présence, par la voix de celui qui est le véritable berger. Seigneur Dieu, écoute nos, nos prières. Inspire et conduis les dirigeants du pays où nous vivons, 
particulièrement ceux de France, des États-Unis et des Pays-Bas, qu'ils prennent des décisions sages et les appliquent avec justice pour le bien et la paix du monde. Que leurs politiques servent la concorde et la paix entre leurs citoyens de toute religion et au régime, ainsi qu'entre toutes les nations. Seigneur Dieu, écoute, écoute nos, nos prières. prières. Ouvre, Seigneur, les yeux de tous les êtres humains à ta miséricorde, partout à l'œuvre. Que trouvant leur joie dans la création tout entière, ils t'honorent de leur bien et soient des intendants fidèles de tes dons. Seigneur Dieu, écoute, écoute nos prières. prières. Dans ta bonté, nous te supplions très humblement, Seigneur, de consoler et de secourir nos bien-aimés frères et sœurs, John et sa famille, Kevin, Sue, Emily, Sally, Vanessa, Elisabeth, et tous ceux qui, dans cette vie passagère, sont dans la peine et l'affliction, dans la pauvreté, la maladie ou toute autre adversité. Nous te prions, Seigneur, pour nos frères et sœurs de toute confession, persécutés ou discriminés, pour le peuple ouïghour, pour les migrants et les réfugiés. Seigneur Dieu, écoute nos prières. Nous bénissons ton Saint Nom pour ceux qui t'ont glorifié par leur vie et par leur mort, te suppliant de leur accorder de t'aimer et de te servir toujours davantage. Accorde-nous la grâce de suivre l'exemple des saints de toute origine qui nous ont précédés dans cette Église, pour avoir part avec eux à ton royaume céleste. Seigneur Dieu, écoute nos prières. D'un seul sang, Ô oh Dieu, tu as créé tous les peuples de la terre. Tu as envoyé ton Fils bien-aimé annoncer la paix à ceux qui sont loin et à ceux qui sont proches. Fais que partout l'on te cherche et puisse te trouver. Ramène les nations à ton bercail. Répands sur toute chair ton esprit et hâte la venue de ton règne. Par Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur, qui vit et règne avec toi et le Saint-Esprit, un seul Dieu, maintenant et toujours. Amen. Amen. On se lève, je stand. Que la paix du Seigneur soit toujours avec vous. Et avec toi aussi. La paix, la paix, soit la, paix. Tous, la paix ici, dans notre petite église, et la paix partout dans le monde ce matin, euh, à ceux qui euh, font partie de, de notre euh, Sainte Communion ce matin, euh, par voie d'Internet. La, la paix à tous. Peace be with you all uh, here in church, and those who are joining us uh, from many different places, uh, including here in New York and elsewhere. Uh, by way of the internet. Thank you for your participation this morning. Asseyez-vous, s'il vous plaît, just sit down if you'd like to. Uh, welcome. Today uh, is our annual celebration of Huguenot Sunday, uh, so especially warm welcome to those members of the Huguenot Society and the Holland Society uh, who may be joining us this morning for uh, our service of the 428th, 26th, 24th, 
ish uh, uh, <laughs> anniversary of the promulgation of the Edict uh, of, uh, of Nantes. Uh, je tiens à remercier tout particulièrement ce matin uh, Joris, Aya, Cynthia, Fred uh, pour la préparation de, 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 des cantiques que nous avons chantées uh, et que nous chanterons dans, dans quelques instants, le solo de, de Cynthia. Uh, tu veux en parler un tout petit peu, uh, Joris, de, de, et parce que je sais qu'à qu la fin, il y aura une présentation uh, que j'annoncerai en quelques secondes. D'accord. Oui alors, euh, avec Aya, Fred et Cynthia, on a travaillé à, à reconstituer ces, ces cantiques donc, euh, dont les paroles sont issues du, du mouvement dont vous pourrez, en savoir, vous pourrez en savoir plus à propos de ce mouvement juste après. Euh, C'est le mouvement des labadistes. Et euh, donc, ces cantiques n'ont pas été chantées depuis well, presque 400 ans, euh, 300 ans, je ne sais pas, 300 ans. Euh, dans, une, dans un service et donc c'est l'occasion pour nous de, de nous joindre avec euh, ces, ces voix du passé et de chanter euh, des louanges tous ensemble euh, il y aura une présentation donc tu veux peut-être la présenter euh, qui arrive juste après euh, le service donc sans transition euh, et juste après cela il y aura un Q&A euh, discussion sur Zoom si vous voulez euh, pour euh, parler un petit peu de, de, ces, de ce service et de se rencontrer parce que sur Youtube c'est pas facile euh, donc voilà, si vous voulez vous joindre à nous et rester en ligne, c'est tout à fait possible après le service aussi. Merci, merci, uh, Joris. You'll find the uh, English translation of some of these uh, of the hymns too, so that you can follow along with the words, uh, whether they're in Dutch, English, or in French. We're using all three of those languages this morning uh, in our service. Just a couple of very quick announcements. Uh, thank you for your continued support of Saint Esprit through these tricky pandemic times. Uh, thank you for your cards and uh, for your donations to the church, uh, without which we could not keep going. Um, it's a testimony to your faithfulness and to your love for each other and for those in need uh, that we have been able to uh, keep our services going through the middle of this pandemic, uh, of which we are beginning to see the end bit by bit. Uh, next week will be our annual general meeting of the parish. It's always the first Sunday in May. Uh, we have a wonderful candidate standing for election to the governing body of the church, the vestry. Uh, Philip has agreed to stand for a two-year term as warden of the church. Uh, and we have uh, three vestry members up for election. Uh, that is to say Guillaume Ahadji, uh, who is standing for a three-year term. Samit Ahlwat, who is standing for a three-year term, and uh, Rita Pulliam, who's agreed to come back on the vestry uh, to, for a three-year term too. So we've got three uh, wonderful candidates there as vestry members, and one wonderful candidate as our, um, uh, one of our wardens here at the church, who are going to be able to see us through the tricky months to come as we reopen the church uh, and face the new challenge of being online and in person at the same time. Uh, so do join us next week if you would like to uh, for our annual general meeting. If you're, if you're not a member of the church, uh, the sole requirements, because we were founded in New York City uh, before the Anglicans arrived, uh, we became an Episcopal Church in 1803, but that does mean that you can be a member of Saint Esprit and of another church at the same time. Not necessarily just of another Episcopal church, although that's possible too, uh, but of a different denomination and be a member of Saint Esprit uh, at the same time, thanks to our French Reformed origins, uh, which we're celebrating today. Uh, the, uh, the presentation will follow on immediately end, at the end of the service, as Joris has mentioned, after the organ postlude, uh, and so do join us for that fascinating presentation uh, on who the Labadists were and what their stories were and, and what legacy they have left us. One other very brief thing, uh, I, uh, speaking to a previous president of the Huguenot Society, uh, whose ancestor was a Cresson. Uh, you'll find that, that crest on the front of our bulletins. Uh, and she told me that her ancestor in his 80s rode Jasper uh, uh, Dankatz uh, from Staten Island to New Jersey and back uh, when he was about 86 years old. Uh, so there's, that's what we're talking about, good strong genes there, uh, that, uh, 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 great stories from our past. Anything else that I'm missing, Fred? 
uh, there's, there's the Zoom uh, discussion afterwards. If you need a password to get into the Zoom discussion, uh, the password is Huguenot. Uh, Huguenot, uh, all caps. Uh, and the spelling is probably inside the bulletin somewhere, if you're not sure where the U's come. <laughs> Alors, présentant avec joie au Seigneur les offrandes de notre vie et de notre travail.
le Seigneur soit avec vous. Et avec toi aussi. Élevons notre cœur. Nous le tournons vers le Seigneur. Rendons grâce au Seigneur notre Dieu. Il est, Il est juste, juste de lui rendre, rendre grâce et louanges. Père Tout-Puissant, Créateur du ciel et de la terre, il est juste et bon de te rendre grâce en tout temps et en tout lieu, et cela nous met en joie. Mais nous devons avant tout te louer pour la glorieuse résurrection de ton Fils Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur, car c'est lui le véritable agneau de Pâques qui a été sacrifié pour nous et qui a enlevé le péché du monde. Par sa mort, il a terrassé la mort. Et par sa résurrection, il a obtenu pour nous la vie éternelle. C'est pourquoi nous te louons. Joignons nos voix aux, aux anges, aux archanges et à toute l'Assemblée céleste qui ne cesse de célébrer la gloire de ton nom en chantant. Seigneur Dieu, Hosanna dans les cieux, Hosanna dans les cieux. Père saint et bienveillant, dans ton amour infini, tu nous as fait pour toi. Et quand nous sommes tombés dans le péché, nous exposant ton mal et à la mort, tu as envoyé dans ta miséricorde ton Fils unique et éternel Jésus-Christ. Partagez notre condition humaine, vivre et mourir parmi nous et nous réconcilier avec toi, Dieu et Père de l'humanité. Il a étendu les bras sur la croix, et obéissant à ta volonté, il s'est offert en sacrifice parfait pour le monde entier. La nuit où il fut livré à la souffrance et à la mort, notre Seigneur Jésus-Christ prit du pain, et après t'avoir remercié, il le partagea et le donna à ses disciples en disant, « Prenez, mangez, ceci est mon corps qui est donné pour vous. Faites ceci en mémoire de moi. » À la fin du repas, il prit la coupe de vin, et après avoir remercié Dieu, il la donna à ses disciples en disant, « Buvez-en tous. » Car ceci est mon sang, le sang de l'Alliance Nouvelle qui est versé pour vous et pour une multitude de gens pour le pardon des péchés. Toutes les fois que vous en boirez, faites-le 
en mémoire de moi. C'est pourquoi nous proclamons le mystère de la foi. Le Christ est mort, le Christ est ressuscité, le Christ reviendra. Père, par ce sacrifice de louange et d'action de grâce, nous célébrons le mémorial de notre rédemption en nous rappelant sa mort, sa résurrection et son ascension. Nous t'offrons ses présents. Sanctifie-les par ton Esprit Saint, afin qu'il soit pour ton peuple le corps et le sang de ton Fils, nourriture et boisson sacrée d'une vie nouvelle et éternelle en lui. Sanctifie-nous également pour que nous puissions recevoir ce sang sacrement avec foi et te servir dans l'unité, dans la constance et dans la paix. Nos derniers jours, conduis-nous avec tous celles et tous ceux qui t'appartiennent, là où règne la joie de ton royaume éternel. Nous te demandons tout cela par ton Fils Jésus-Christ, par lui, avec lui et en lui, dans l'unité du Saint-Esprit, tout en or et toute gloire te revienne, Père Tout-Puissant, pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Amen. Nous allons maintenant prier comme le Christ, notre Sauveur, nous l'a appris. Notre Père, qui es aux cieux, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ton règne vienne. Que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain de ce jour. Pardonne-nous nos offenses, comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous laisse pas entrer en tentation, mais délivre-nous du mal. Car c'est à toi qu'appartiennent le règne, la puissance et la gloire, pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. Alléluia, le Christ, notre Pâques, est sacrifié pour nous. Célébrons donc cette fête. Alléluia. Les dons de Dieu au peuple de Dieu. Prenez-les pour vous rappeler que le Christ est mort pour vous et recevez-les dans votre cœur avec foi et action de grâce.
que Yom. Seigneur, dès que nous nous souvenons de toi, nous nous réjouissons en toi. Ton nom est penché comme de l'huile, beaucoup plus doux que le miel et le pauvre. Nous restaure et nous refait. Fais-nous aimer davantage ta gloire que notre propre contentement. Tu es le centre du cœur. Quel moyen donc de nous reposer ailleurs que dans le tien Sois seul notre fin, Seigneur, comme tu es seul notre principe. Tire-nous à toi et nous courons, tressaillant du désir de voir ta face. Dieu éternel, écoute les prières de nos bien-aimés frères et sœurs à la maison. On se lève du stade. Que demeure en vous la grâce de Dieu, la grâce pascale qu'il vous offre aujourd'hui, qu'elle vous protège de l'oubli et du doute. Par la résurrection de son Fils, il vous a fait déjà renaître, qui vous rappelle toujours à cette joie que rien, même pas la mort, ne pourra vous ravir et que la bénédiction de Dieu Tout-Puissant, Père, Fils et Saint-Esprit, descende sur vous et demeure à jamais. Amen. Amen. Avant notre dernier cantique, j'ai quelques petites remarques sur le bulletin. Euh, les cantiques, le premier, euh, le solo de, de Cynthia, euh, euh, étaient euh, les cantiques de la communauté labadiste, dont vous allez entendre davantage, euh, après, immédiatement après notre Sainte Communion ce matin, uh, the hymns that we sang at the beginning of the service and Cynthia's beautiful solo uh, with their translation provided there, uh, the hymns last sung by the Labadist community here in New York City 300 years ago or thereabouts. Um, the flowers that you can see in the church have been chosen specially for Huguenot Sunday. Uh, we have some very Dutch orange tulips uh, around the Paschal candle. Uh, we have Huguenot lilac around the little uh, statue of Mary here. The story went, according to Joris, uh, that um, uh, Huguenot ladies brought the seeds of the lilac trees bound in the, the, the ribbons of their hats uh, into, into uh, America. So they're a sort of Huguenot flower. Uh, and behind me, I have two arrangements there in the colours of the Huguenot cross, which you can see in our window, blue, yellow and white. We're going to sing our final hymn, Vous tous les peuples de la terre, uh, to an old Huguenot tune that's been sung consistently by this community here in the little French church of Saint-Esprit uh, for the last almost 400 years, or it will be in uh, a few years' time. Uh, Vous tous les peuples de la terre. We'll sing three verses in French and the final two verses in English.
allons dans le monde, nous réjouissant de la puissance de l'Esprit. Alléluia, Alléluia. Nous rendons grâce à Dieu. Alléluia, Alléluia. C'était super. Euh, tu veux te joindre à nous ici, euh, Aya, euh, pour, euh, pour introduire un peu ce qui va se suivre. Thank you so much, Aya. That was beautiful. That was lovely. The, and Cynthia, too. Thank you so much. Beautiful solo. Uh, I, just to announce uh, at the end of our service, this is obviously joyous. And here's Aya, who you might have seen at some point if uh, Fred pointed the camera in that direction. But Aya is uh, on. Uh, 
talented uh, uh, organist and uh, the person who reconstructed uh, the music from the original manuscripts, and you'll find out all about that in a few minutes, how they were printed, how you can take those old uh, manuscripts that Joris uncovered uh, in the Netherlands, yes, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, turned them into hymns that are now singable uh, in the Little French Church, as you've heard this morning. Uh, thank you, both of you, and to Cynthia too, and to Fred for all of his hard work behind the scenes, and to our sacristan Wendy, who uh, helped us with the flowers and setting everything up, making sure that uh, things looked beautiful for uh, one of our favourite Sundays in the year, uh, Huguenot Sunday. Uh, anything to add before we click on to the, um, the video? Well, see no. Yeah, we are looking us. forward to seeing you yes. at the end of the presentation and talk to you for, oh. yeah. Great. Great. Good. Thank you. Enjoy the presentation and thanks again. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much. <laughs> Bonjour, Aya. Bonjour, Joyce. Bonjour à tous. Uh, merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Today, Aya and I will introduce you to the religious movement of the Labadist and the hymns which we sang during our Huguenot Sunday service today. So we called our presentation The Sweet Singers of Israel. You will understand why very soon, the transatlantic poetic and musical journey of the Labadist movement. You'll know who are the Labadists in a minute too. If you didn't follow our Holy Communion service in which we sang some of their hymns, you can find the video on our YouTube channel. On Huguenot Sunday, Saint-Esprit uh, remembers the legacy of French Protestant refugees who fled their country because of religious persecutions. We also pray for all the persons who are persecuted today for their religious faith and practices throughout the world and especially in France and in the US. The story Aya and I are going to lead you through is that of a 17th century dissenting Protestant movement and their poetic and musical creations. I came across the Labadist during my master's uh, at the Sorbonne with Professor Olivier Millet, and I researched their books scattered in libraries uh, throughout Europe and America. I was really interested uh, in their hymns, especially. Strangely enough, and it's quite a nice coincidence, um, the, it was years before I came to Saint-Esprit, and it's quite a providential coincidence uh, that my research also relates to the history of Saint-Esprit. Here you can see some crests from uh, some of the families of uh, founding families of Saint-Esprit, uh, de la Montagne, Bayard and Cresson, who were uh, members of the Labadist movement in America. There were others like de la Grange and um, Bouchel that were not on the crests in our church. So the period where the Labadist uh, developed or appeared, if you want, um, was a very special period in the history of Western Europe. Um, so you may wonder who are these uh, Labadists? Labadist uh, is, Labadism is a new Christian movement that emerged in the Walloon and Dutch Reformed churches in the Netherlands in the late 1660s. It is a time of great prosperity, as we probably know, uh, in the Netherlands. That's, this period of time is often referred to as the Dutch Golden Age. That's the period of Rembrandt, of tulips, and of all this uh, economic and cultural boom. It's a period of true embarras de richesse for the Netherlands. But this prosperity that you can see a little bit on this painting um, also caused reactions, a bit like today, um, when you have uh, great prosperity. And some people in Dutch society thought that the established church was being too outward and too worldly. And these people yearned for a more personal, a more communal, and transform transformative experience of the gospel. And the Labadist movement was gathering a lot of uh, these critiques. And um, although it was short-lived, it really catalyzed these critiques and profoundly uh, influenced the religious life of the Protestant churches in Europe and especially in the Netherlands. 
So here you have just have a, a quick a summary of who, who are the Labadists. They were a Protestant movement. They emerged from the Dutch and Walloon Church. The Walloon Church is the French-speaking Reformed Church in the Netherlands. They started really in 1669 and have a couple of core beliefs. And one of them is the fact that they're calling into their community elects and are really interested in the form of holistic change of life through piety, through goods which are held in common. And they also have a millenarian expectation of the coming of Christ uh, that they consider and understand as a form of general restoration that's about to come. Their founder um, is, uh, one of their two founders is Jean de Labadie. Um, de, de, de Labadie was a co-founder of the movement with another person we'll see in a moment, who is Anna Maria von Schurman. Labadie was a very strange bird in the religious landscape of the 17th century. He was a mystic, that is, he had very personal visions and encounters with uh, divine beings, and especially Christ, uh, but also the Virgin Mary. And he was a gifted preacher. Uh, he was a theologian and also a poet. Uh, his life challenged, as you can see on this list, uh, many of the denominational boundaries of the time, but also the cultural ones and the national ones that were uh, being affirmed and really established at that time. So he was born originally uh, near Bordeaux in France. He was born in a Roman Catholic uh, family and he became a priest, uh, he studied in a Jesuit school, but then he, he also converted to uh, the Reformed faith after a lot of troubles. And after his conversion, he served in Geneva, which was at the time the capital of uh, the Reformation and especially the Reform uh, faith. And after serving a couple of years in Geneva, he arrived in the Netherlands in 1667. The, the movement that Labadie formed uh, and started a bit later in 1669 uh, uh, was called Labadism because some of the, his detractors associated, in him, associated the movement with his own uh, personal charisma. Um, he had indeed a very mystical call for the regeneration of the Church of God, which really left him uh, unsatisfied with what he, he saw uh, and experienced in contemporary established churches from both, both Catholic and Protestant. And a lot of his wandering through these denominations um, have to do with this deep yearning he had to restore the Church. Um, and, and really find, uh, find a new uh, restored form of piety and common life uh, um, in the spirit of the gospel. So when he arrived in the Netherlands in 1667 to serve as a pastor, his charismatic preaching and call for personal devotion uh, attracted many followers, and many of them were from noble birth and from the local elite um, and he uh, particularly uh, became friend with one of them, who is Anna Maria von Schurman. Anna Maria von Schurman is a really fascinating woman. She became Labadie's spiritual friend during all those years, and uh, since what they met in 1667, uh, uh, 16, uh, um, they stayed together until the end of their life. She was a gifted artist. Uh, she was also a musician, uh, harpsichordist, <laughs> like Aya, and a poet, um, and a defender of the education of women, which um, she published a couple of books and uh, had discussions with a lot of uh, European scholars on this theme of the education of women. She was so renowned that people called her the star of Utrecht, the Dutch Minerva, that's the goddess of wisdom, um, and all, all of these uh, studies that she, um, that she versed in herself in uh, included speaking many languages. She studied a lot of languages and could write and correspond with a lot of scholars of the time uh, in these languages too. She was 
she's most uh, mostly remembered for being the first woman to study at the university and advocate uh, really for the access um, uh, of women to education. If you want to learn more uh, about uh, Anna Maria von Schurman, you can find a lot of information on annamariavonschurman.org. Uh, and you can find also more information in our uh, bibliography uh, that we're going to post in the comments here and also on the first page of our website. So being, uh, besides being a very learned woman, a, f a femme de lettres, Schurman was also a theologian and, and she studied deeply the scripture and she was a devout woman, a devout Christian. Labadi and Schurman really got on well on this, on this topic as you can imagine and they, they became close friends and both of them were really attracted by the reformation and the, the idea of restoring the, restoring the church. So they both championed this renewal of the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, and it clashed a lot with uh, the established church of the time and, um, and the, the, the institutions of the Dutch Reformed Church. This um, led to a split that happened in 1669. That's the date that we usually understand to be the founding of the Labadist movement. Labadies, Germans, and all their friends' desire for a spiritual and moral regeneration of the Reformed Church kind of hit a wall when Labadie was dismissed from his pastoral charge uh, in the Reformed Church. And as a consequence, in 1669, the members of the community moved uh, to Amsterdam and they were soon called Labadists. Uh, they prayed, they shared, they lived in, in some buildings uh, on Lorechat in uh, the Jordan neighborhood in Amsterdam. And they had all their uh, uh, gift, their, their goods in common. They uh, lived in this form on the model of the early church. They used different terms to refer to themselves. They wouldn't call themselves Labadists, which was more kind of an insult. But they, they talked about themselves as l'œuvre de Dieu, the work of God, opus Dei. Uh, the Church of the Lord, and the French Flemish Church, or the Reformed Church secluded from the world. You see, all these terms are really giving you an idea of what they thought they were doing and what they thought they were. That is, they were not so much uh, falling into some uh, denominational understanding of what, what was the Church, but they were challenging it uh, by really trying to go back to a form of unity of the church to beyond uh, denominational or even cultural uh, boundaries. This was also um, linked to a deep core of a form of monasticism and monastic life, as you can see in the Reformed Church secluded from the world. So all of this uh, you can see it in the community which really developed uh, starting at, at this moment. Um, they published a lot of books starting in Amsterdam. Uh, here you can see a picture of the Petit Catechisme ou Commencement d'Instruction pour les petits enfants qui commencent à parler et à entendre quelque chose. That's already the third edition in 1683. Um, that's a very interesting book because it's bilingual catechism. So you're on one side you have French, on the other one you have Dutch. And that's something we're going to see um, in which very much part of the culture and identity of the Labadist movement is that it is a bilingual movement. After many persecutions, the Labadists uh, and wanderings in Germany, uh, in Denmark, after the death of their founder, in 1673, the Labadists settled in, in a little village, uh, which is called Vuvert in Friesland, in the north of the Netherlands. I can show you a map here. So here you see, um, oh, little pointer, pointer. here you see um, Labadie was born here, Geneva is here, uh, that's the south of the Netherlands here and Amsterdam is here. So they were here for a couple of, time, uh, of, of months, mostly. Then they went to Germany, to Denmark, and they landed in Vuvert in Friesland, which was kind of a secluded part of the Netherlands of the time, quite away from uh, the, the urban hub of Amsterdam, uh, then Aar, La Haye, 
Um, so it's already kind of a, a very uh, monastic spot that they chose uh, here in Vieuwert, in Friesland. So I can go back to this slide. Uh, so the community, when it was in Vieuwert, here you can see a picture, a view of Walter Castle, where they settled, which belonged to some of the prominent members of the community. Um, so when they settled there, the community really started to thrive and become sustainable. Uh, they had mixed farming, some form of industry, bookbinding, uh, and they also practiced uh, medicine and, and really sold a lot of their um, concoctions and, and uh, drugs. The community, it's really difficult to estimate the number of the community at that stage, but some people said that they reached uh, 600 members just in the little village of uh, Vuvert, but they had followers uh, in all major cities in the Netherlands, in Germany, and as we will see, in the New World too. So here you can see also a picture of um, a mummy, well, a dried body that you can still see today. There are a couple of them in the crypt of the church of Uvert, and some of them are Labadists, uh, most surely, uh, but they've never been studied really in depth, and that would be a very interesting uh, thing to do, I think, for uh, specialists of uh, early modern um, life and, and, and religious communities. So the Labadists went, as I told you, overseas. They not only stayed in, um, in this part um, of the Netherlands, um, but the Netherlands was really internationally connected through uh, trade and colonial uh, enterprises. And the Labadists settled in two uh, different uh, places in America, in the Americas, in the New Netherland, uh, that is New York and the adjacent uh, colony of Maryland, and also in Suriname in South America. I'm not going to talk much about Suriname, uh, although it's a very interesting uh, settlement also of the Labadists. But I'm going to, we're going to talk more about, of course, the Labadists in New York and Maryland. The community in Friesland, in Vuvert, became overpopulated, so they also f were looking for other places uh, to settle and to uh, also spread um, their experience, spiritual experiences and way of life. Um, so here you can see on this picture a view of the port of New York. Uh, I think it's actually inspired was by a Labadist drawing uh, that we will see uh, soon. And uh, here you also have a picture um, taken by Pita uh, of the three uh, 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 two uh, letters uh, from Suriname sent to uh, the Netherlands, the community, uh, where they talk about uh, the life of the community in Suriname. So we know a lot about the experience of uh, the Labadists' experience uh, in North America because of one of the oldest accounts of life in New York, um, which was written by a Labadist. Uh, so it gives you a, a really like a little vignette of, well, it's quite a long vignette, but kind of a, a big tableau of uh, the life in, in, uh, in New York at the time. And it was written by Jasper Dankartz. Jasper Dankartz was a elder of the Labadist community, and he was sent uh, to uh, New Amsterdam, uh, New Netherlands, it was already New York at the time, but to the, this region that he calls New Netherlands, as you can see um, here on uh, the first page of his journal, that's, um, that's in the custody of the Brooklyn Historical Society, and that was rediscovered in the 19th century. So you see um, here the first page, and in this journal that he wrote to actually send back to the mother uh, community in Friesland, he really describes, uh, describes in detail uh, the life of the colony and the people he meets. He really likes to give um, truer than life uh, portraits of uh, members of the uh, colonists that he, he meets. And that's a very touching uh, portrayal of the community and a lot of uh, members of the Huguenot society or people may recognize actually their ancestors uh, in some of these uh, stories that Dankertz uh, tells us. So Dankertz has a very critical outlook uh, of the community uh, that he visits 
the communities that he visits in uh, the New World and in, in, in New, New York. Uh, here I put you a little uh, excerpt from uh, his journal. It gives you an idea of, uh, of his style and how he's writing. It's quite a fun read, uh, to be honest. Uh, he's, he's, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to, to visit New York through his eyes in uh, 1679. He has a very critical look, as I said, uh, on the colonial society, because as a Labadist, he, he also sees it, uh, he sees all the worldliness in it, uh, the greed, um, the behavior of the colonist with, that he uh, usually uh, deems as quite unchristian. Um, and so this little excerpt gives you an idea, and I'm going to read passages of it, maybe not all of it. That's um, the one day after he landed in New York. Uh, and so he arrives there, and there's the fort that you can see here, and the church that was at the moment the main church, and I think the only church at the moment uh, in New York City. Uh, that's a modern uh, this depiction of it, but that gives you an idea. He describes it, actually, in his journal. So the church being in the fort, we had the opportunity to look through the latter, as we had come too early for preaching. Uh, so he describes the church. And he also describes uh, the preacher who is there that day, um, who was the Dutch uh, minister. He was a thick, corpulent person with a red and bloated face and a very slabbering speech. His text was, and then he goes on describing the sermon. And just after the sermon, it's quite a fun moment. So he's lodging as, well, at two people and, uh, at a family. And, well, the family he finds a bit unchristian and ungodly. Um, just after the sermon, they actually invite him to go uh, have a drink. So um, would be able, So he, they're invited to a place where they would be able to taste the beer of New Netherlands in as much as it was a brewery. And he's not really pleased by the company there that he finds quite uh, unchristian, as, he, as he, he, he describes, on account of this, of its being to uh, some extent a pleasant spot, it was resorted to on Sundays by all sorts of revelers and was a low pot house. Our company immediately found acquaintances there and joined them, of course. And they were ungodly, so the ungodly joined with the ungodly. Um, but it being repugnant to our feeling to be there, we walked into the orchard to seek pleasure in contemplating the innocent objects of nature. Among others, other trees, we observed a mulberry tree, the leaves of which were as large as a plate. The wife showed us peers larger than the fist, picked from a three years graft, which had borne 40 of them. So this is a very uh, poignant description that it really gives you an idea of how he looks at uh, New York society um, of the time. So he doesn't really fit. Um, he's kind of an observer of all this society. And I think that's really what is interesting about it. That it doesn't he doesn't come here to do business. He doesn't come. He, he comes here to look for a spot to settle a community, but he has kind of a noblesse oblige look at uh, the community uh, in New York City. Some of his critiques of uh, New York society of the time um, has to do about the abuse uh, of the colonists and their greed. Uh, the way they exert slavery um, and in plantations for uh, cropping tobacco, which are two things that the Labadists at that time uh, deemed totally ungodly, uh, slavery and tobacco. And they're also, he's also shocked by the way uh, a lot of the colonists treat uh, Native American people by giving them alcohol uh, and um, behaving with them in a very uh, inappropriate way. He really notices the lack of devotion and what he calls true faith amongst the colonists. And so it also, in a sense, gives, uh, like, strengthen his call and the call of the Labadist, I think, to come to America uh, to find uh, and create a, a pure New Jerusalem uh, in the wilderness somewhere. Um, so most, what's really interesting, I think, in his journal is that the most important character is a Mohawk Dutch uh, Christian woman whose name is Aleta. She has really like the, the most uh, the length the, the the most detailed portrait 
uh, of any person in uh, the journal is a portrait of Aleta. And she is, uh, he records is, is what she, uh, she tells him. And that's a very, very touching uh, description. Uh, she, it's a couple of pages in the journal. Uh, and here there's the, the entry in the journal about it. So I asked her to Aleta to relate to me herself how it had gone with her from the first of her coming to Christendom, both outwardly and inwardly, you see. Looking at me, she said, how glad I am I that I am so fortunate that God should permit me to behold such Christians whom I have so long desired to see and to whom I may speak from the bottom of my heart without fear and that there are such Christians in the world. How often have I asked myself, are there no other Christians than those amongst whom we live? Which is quite a Labadis question too. Who are so godless and lead worse lives than the Indians and yet have such a pure and holy religion? Now I see God thinks of us and I sent you from the other end of the world to speak to us. I was surprised to find, so that's Dankart who speaks again, I was surprised to find so far in the woods and amongst Christians, but why should I, why, but why amongst Christians, among, among Indians, among Christians, ten times worse than Indians, a person who should address me with such affection and love of God? But I answered and comforted her. Then he concludes, and that's a very powerful conclusion, when Yes, she expressed to me more reality of the truth of Christianity than anyone, whether minister or other person, in all New Netherlands. So it's quite a powerful statement from Dunkartz uh, here. And here you can see a, a picture taken from uh, his journal. He tried to do some sketches. Uh, he even says that he's, he's a bit disappointed that he didn't uh, learn to sketch before he came over to America because well, he could maybe have improved a bit of his style. Um, but here you see a, port a couple of fish and a Native American woman that he portrayed. That's the only portrait of a person that he actually uh, drew in, a, in, uh, in his journal. Um, so that's quite, it's quite a touching uh, uh, passage, this one. If you're interested in learning more about uh, the journal of Jasper Dankartz, you can easily find an English translation online it's really a fun read, I think. Uh, some passages are a bit lengthy, but you can skip them. And uh, one of my favorite passages, to be honest, is when he visits Harvard College, and uh, where he finds actually the students smoking in the dorms, so he's wondering <laughs> if it's actually a tavern or a school. And he really also pities uh, um, the empty printing office and the quality of their press, the press of Harvard University, or well, Harvard College of the time, uh, which is actually more meager um, than the Labadists' uh, press in Friesland, the one from which all the Labadist books were printed. Um, so things uh, change over time, um, as you can see in America. Now, um, Dan Katz and his friends, uh, his friend, uh, that's um, uh, Sluter, uh, who, with whom he was visiting and looking for a place, uh, to settle, found a tract of land to settle, and it is now in Cecil County in Maryland. So it, this place became called uh, the Labadee Tract, uh, and the estate was also called New Bohemia or and Bohemia Manor. So the Labadees settled in uh, New Bohemia in Maryland around 1684, that is two or three years after the arrival of the first Labadists. Um, uh, colonists in New York, so that for a couple of years uh, the Labadists were uh, only in, in New York gathering together uh, in some form of house meetings and, and praying uh, alongside each other. So uh, they came from, most of the Labadists came directly from the mother community in the Netherlands uh, to settle this new plantation that they, they, they bought. Uh, so the Labadist movement had followers in New York, as I mentioned. Uh, some of the historic families of New York are closely associated with the Labadists. Uh, amongst others, there is Peter Bayard, uh, who was one of the earliest Labadists in, in, in the New World. 
uh, who was actually the nephew of the governor, uh, the governor um, Stuyvesant. So you see, it's also quite a upper elite uh, group uh, that's joining the, the Labadist uh, movement, just like in the Netherlands. Um, some other people uh, joined the, the movement um, or had uh, house meetings like in New York and uh, actually uh, Peter Bayard and his wife, Blandine uh, Kirstede, they had this form of house uh, meetings in New York City. On the Labadi tract that you can see here on the map, so you see Baltimore uh, on one side and uh, amongst the little hearts here, I couldn't find another way to mark the, the tract, uh, is the, the, the tract of land that was called the Labadee Tract. So just uh, on the, the entrance and close to the canal uh, of the Delaware. So they developed a community there which was really on the model of Uvert, which to a certain sense became problematic because it's another world and another reality. Uh, and they lacked uh, a lot of workforce uh, when they came um, because not a lot of actually reform uh, and Huguenots uh, from the first generation immigrants joined the community. A lot of the people who joined who were Huguenots and already in America were already second generation. You can imagine that if you're coming from um, a foreign country, you don't really want to go into a new religious movement. You want to try to stick uh, with people whom uh, you know maybe from where you come from, that is in France, or um, people um, who really belong to the same faith as you knew in the old world. So they actually attracted second generation Huguenots in America and people who were already part of the movement in the Netherlands who came over as a community uh, to settle this tract of land. The community um, went into quite a lot of trouble um, because of the abusive leadership of Peter Sleuter uh, and his wife. Um, and a lot of the ideals of the Labadists um, that were still at play in, in the Netherlands were also uh, revised uh, to meet with the reality of, of the new world. And the, they became also um, inculcated uh, to a certain extent to the, the, the colonial uh, life of the communities around them. And they introduced um, African slave labor in the early uh, 1690s, something that Dankartz disapproved of, but you see uh, it changed. Uh, and also the cropping of tobacco, another thing that was actually uh, not allowed for the Labadists uh, at the time. So you see, you had to adapt to other realities. Um, and uh, the land was uh, owned in common, just like in Vuvert, until 1698. And this uh, tract of land um, is still uh, um, the ancestral home of the Bayard, Bouchel, and Slaughter families. Here you can see a picture of the great house that's still standing, um, that's uh, on the tract of land. And some of the streets and roads around uh, in, on the tract bear the name of, of Labadee, like Labadee Mill Lane here. Uh, so you can visit, uh, it's a fun, uh, it's a nice, cute uh, rural part of uh, Maryland. So they, the Labadee stayed uh, in this place uh, for about 15 years, you see, before they actually uh, started to disband or, um, or just live as more individual uh, settlers. Now, when the Labadists, Dankerts, and the succeeding uh, Labadists uh, came to America, they brought with them their religious culture and practices, which was really kind of the core identity of the Labadist movement, which was quite different from the Reformed uh, Church. Um, so they organized conventicles in New York City and they shared their religious literature in French and in Dutch with those uh, who were interested. So they brought in his journal, Dankert talks about and tells us about how he translated some of the books and poems from French into Dutch when he is actually traveling uh, because he only has a French copy so he has to translate for some people who are only able to speak uh, Dutch. And he hands out also a lot of books uh, from Labadee, and he actually comes across people who already have books uh, of Labadee uh, in New York even before they came. So you see that's uh, quite present in this uh, part of uh, the colonies. So in the Netherlands, the Labadists had written and collected many hymns in French um, in various hymnals. Here you can see um, 
um, three of them. Uh, I'm going to explain them in a bit more in detail. So when Dunkartz visited America for the first time in 1679, the first hymn was just the first hymnal was just published, Cantique Sacré et Spirituel. Um, it says second edition, but uh, actually it's most it's a first edition because um, uh, it's so uh, it's a really re uh, recreated hymnal. Uh, so it was published in 1678, and this hymnal um, uh, comprehends some um, cant cantic canticles that were written by Labadie himself, but a lot of cantic of, of hymns are actually uh, written by members of the community. So we don't know their identity, uh, but there was an uh, important production of hymns inside the community. The second uh, recueil that you see here, Recueil de Cantique Spirituel, pour l'usage familier de l'Église du Seigneur, retirée du monde et recueillie à présent à vie ouverte en Frise, uh, was published um, actually well, when Dunkirk came back uh, basically from his travel in 1680. And the last one that you can see here is a combination of um, the first two that you see and that was published in Dutch in 1683. Uh, and so the title says Eilige Gesangen, um, Holy Hymns, uh, Uit et Franz Vertalt, uh, translated mm -hmm. from the French. And you also have a poem attached to it at the end by Anna Maria von Thurman about the coming of the kingdom of God, of Christ. Um, so you see that the, the whole corpus of the whole uh, collection of Labadist hymns was really bilingual. And um, that's what we're going to, that's what we sung today in our service uh, in both languages. And that's what really uh, um, gathered together uh, people in the Labadis communities who spoke uh, both languages, and not all of them spoke both, uh, but they could uh, at least uh, sing in their um, preferred language. Um, so this hymnal, the last one, Eilige Zangen, is really the one we're going to talk about because it's translation um, of the French hymns, that is, all the hymns that we have in Eilige Zangen, we also have French equivalent of them, a French original. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, hymnal. The on only remaining copies exist in the Netherlands and in Europe. So it's a hymnal that was used in America, but um, as far as I know, the, no copy still exists here. So, and that's probably why also it, it was, uh, um, nobody thought of it in America, really as a part of uh, American hymnody uh, in the colonial period. So, as I mentioned, the Labadist community was at least bilingual uh, in its worship or practice, just like the Netherlands and New York of the time were at least bilingual, because you had people, uh, of course, Dutch settlers, you had uh, uh, Huguenots who would speak French, and all, a lot of uh, English speakers too, Swedish, um, Germans, so the, the reality of New York has always been a melting pot uh, or a, at least a, a place where a lot of different languages and culture uh, live together. And the Labadis hymnal is really representative of that because of its um, bilingual uh, nature. It's a bit like really today when in New York you see like the only presence of Spanish and English in the streets and everywhere. Uh, some members of the community, as I mentioned, were also English speakers, like John Moll, that we're going to talk about uh, later. Um, and Labadie, their founder, was only a French speaker, and he wrote a great number of hymns only in French, so all the hymns were translated. Uh, it's quite touching here at Saint-Esprit because we're always uh, uh, dealing with translation as being a French-speaking uh, Episcopal church, and we have always to uh, switch between languages and always move between these uh, different words and gifts and tongues. Um, so the members of the community sang actually their hymns. We have, uh, we know about that. Uh, they sang them sometimes both in French and in Dutch, and it's totally possible to sing hymns at the same time uh, in two different languages. Um, and they you really use them in their house meetings and also during their daily chores. Some hymns are actually composed especially for some uh, chores. So they translated them in both languages. And, um, and that's, that's one of, um, of the reason why uh, also um, 
the Labadis hymnal is really unique and the, the corpus of Labadis hymns is unique because it's uh, early modern witness of, uh, of really a bilingual community uh, with the uh, same common corpus. Um, so the Eile Rechzangen that we are going to talk more in detail uh, about uh, was published in 1683, as I mentioned, and it's uh, a really precious witness of an early transatlantic to uh, piety, um, and some of the copies include this register that Aya is going to uh, to uh, explain to us. Uh, this register is basically a, a, a little booklet at the end of the hymnal um, that's giving us some tunes that are not common. That is, some of the hymns were sung on the Genevan Psalter, the tunes of the Genevan Psalters, uh, but these are not um, these the Genevan Psalter tunes, so they give us the tunes so that we can know how to sing them. So all the, the, the hymns that are in this register, in this uh, register, we have the French and the Dutch. Now I'm going to walk you through um, this, um, some of these hymns and try to see if we can actually call them um, the sweet singers of Israel. And if I use this expression into um, uh, quotation marks, it's because um, the Labadists um, were, I mean, in the, in, the, in the papers of William Penn, who visited the Labadist community a couple of times in Europe and in America, there is this very strange list that seems to hint at a specific city of and quality of Labadist congregational singing. So I mentioned John Moore, uh, who was an English-speaking um, member of the community, and he was uh, also one of the patrons of the Labadist movement in Maryland. Um, and in 1682, he was, as the papers of uh, William Penn says, living peacefully and religiously uh, in Bohemia Manor, and he's called on a list uh, by Penn, a sweet singer of Israel. So on this list, what's really strange is that this list only lists people um, in, with generic terms, that is, they are, he lists uh, denominations, nationalities, uh, so he says like a Quaker, a German, and he says a sweet, sweet singer of Israel. And that's to qualify uh, John uh, Moll, who was a, a Labadist. So that's a very uh, enigmatic um, mention, but we may understand it when we look closely at the Labadist hymns. Mm -hmm. um, so let's have a look uh, at some of the hymns uh, we sang today, because they reveal this uh, specific uh, piety uh, of the Labadist, its diversity and its themes, and Aya will walk us mm -hmm. through uh, the music and really show us also how uh, it's showing some form of diversity. Um, so our congregational hymn today was Abîme de Bonté, Afron von Rudigheid in Dutch. Um, this hymn uh, is quite meditative. It talks about the mysterious bounties of God that invites those who contemplate them to surrender to his love. So that's a very mystical theme, if you want, in a hymn. Uh, you also see in this hymn how the, the, this spiritual themes backs up the, the, the communal life of the, of the Labadist uh, movement, which was based on the sharing of goods. And in this uh, stanza, you can really see it. Soisan uh, uh, of our hearts, so be uh, you alone, um, the Lord and master of our hearts, um, of that which so lawfully belongs to you. And in offering all our goods and your, our being with glad hearts, receive our all from this time forth. Uh, so Nigel did a, a lovely translation for us of this stanza from uh, Abime de Bonté. And uh, so in this stanza, uh, you can really see the, the theme of Labadis piety that's uh, a form of merge of mystical abandonment to God and abandonment in the life of the community. Our second hymn that uh, was actually uh, Cynthia's solo that you can listen to if you've not in uh, the recording of her service, um, it's more of a spiritual song. It's really a kind of, uh, yeah, a spiritual song. It's various, very short lines. 
uh, it's quite light and springy. Um, in this hymn, the contemplation of nature, the one we just saw uh, in Dunkard's journal, you see, that's this idea of a pristine uh, nature, uh, really leads uh, the faithful to the contemplation uh, of God through singing. So the singing of the birds joins and echoes the singing of the angels and resonates with the reality of the human singer and the community who is singing at the moment uh, that hymn or Cynthia for us today. Uh, so it really invites the faithful to find a place in creation between the birds and the angels. Um, that's really what we saw in, in Denkers, as I mentioned. And, and the song of the birds leads the faithful to contemplate the body of Jesus, and you can see it in, throughout the different stanzas, um, the spouse uh, of the Christian soul, soul um, whose song is even more beautiful than the song of the birds and also the human uh, songs that we are uh, singing uh, congregationally. So finally, contrary to angels and birds, and that's what you can see in this uh, specific, uh, this precise stanza, um, humans, whoever they are, can kneel down in prayer. Birds can do it, angels can do it, but humans can. And that's what this is saying. Come all folk, come all ages, fall on your knees to give him homage. It is your privilege. Why would you tarry? Come without qualm. May nothing hold you back from such a sweet Lord. That's a very lovely hymn. And in this stanza, you can see really also the, the missionary aspect of the Labadist faith that's um, inviting uh, everybody and uh, people um, of all ages and, 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 and cultures uh, into uh, the, the community. Alongside this, um, this hymn, I've started to put some pictures of uh, um, that were actually drawn by a Labadist, and this one is really, I'm going to talk more about her, Maria Sibylia Merian, uh, but you can see how they resonate together. Now our um, hymn that we're going, to, uh, there's another hymn that we'd like to share with you that was not in our service um, recording, it's Jésus est tout, um, Jésus est all. Jesus is all. So I'm going to play it for you and then I'm going to comment it uh, shortly. Jesus is all and we have left and it's in heart and for none left. Jesus is all and we have left and it's in heart and for none left. We come with him to freedom to Jesus' heart to fall the king that he has here been in. So as you could hear, once again, it's a very contemplative hymn that calls for uh, a holistic life transformation. 
you could find also the, the lyrics of this hymn in the bulletin. Um, Jesus is compared to the tree of life whose sweet fruit gives eternal life. So in the stanza, I have a single out here, the poet plays with the polysemy of the word virtue, which in French and in English, in quite an old-fashioned way of talking about it, means both moral virtues and the special properties, for instance, of a plant. Um, so you could see, you can say, for instance, uh, the virtue of tea is to be an antioxidant. And here you see that um, the poet is playing with this polysemy of the word virtue. Uh, since love garners in its bosom all virtues, the fruit, the tree, and leaf. So different parts uh, of the same plant may have different virtues, also a bit like the different gifts in the church. And Jesus is described here uh, in a very medicinal way, um, that is the panacea. Jesus is the universal remedy that combines the properties of the fruit, the tree, and the leaf. So the different biological parts of the plant, if you want, and the different virtues of them are gathered together in the community, in their singing, and in the reality of, of, of Christ and his body, uh, which is um, in, in which the, 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 the church is uh, restored. So there's much more to say about the Labadists, um, and I'm going to just uh, conclude uh, with uh, Maria Sibylla Merian, because uh, she's a really f another fascinating Labadist woman, um, and a lot of her work uh, as a naturalist artist um, is, has been heavily influenced uh, by Labadist piety and Labadist hymnody. Um, there is actually um, um, some... Um, People have, have said that she joined the community uh, after having read some of the hymns by Labadie. And you can totally see that at play on some of her plates, like this one, where she has a form of really keen attention to the natural world um, and its organization, the way things are related to. Uh, and that's quite of a, a pioneering uh, view that she introduced in natural science uh, to relate um, the plant and the insect, mm -hmm. to see them in relation, to understand what people are saying about the plant. Uh, that is when she, um, she studies plants, she also talks about the properties and all of, of this um, by also really looking at, um, at them together and trying to assemble them in her plates. So she was a, natu a naturalist artist, that is someone who draws uh, and for, at that time, scientific, artistic, religious reasons, um, plants and, and insects. Um, she, she was a member, I mean, she was uh, coming from a very prominent family of German artists. And she joined uh, the Labadist community in Friesland in 1683. Um, she, she has been said, and I actually studied quite recently, that she has pioneered the modern understanding of ecology. Uh, because she introduced a direct study of insects uh, to draw plates. That is, before people sometimes would draw insects by not actually studying them or like looking carefully at them, just like Dankart's look carefully uh, at uh, the, his environment in uh, the New World. And she actually also went to America, not to um, North America, but to South America, where the Labadist had connections, that is in Suriname. And after a uh, field research in Suriname, uh, she published a very famous uh, book, which is the Metamorphosis Insectorum uh, Surinamentium, uh, the Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname. And uh, the plates um, come uh, from, this, um, from this book. It's a beautiful book that really tries to describe uh, what's the fauna and flora of Suriname a bit like Dankart's did, and to a certain extent, uh, spiritually, how uh, the poems of Labadie also do. So that's all uh, that I have really uh, for us um, on, 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 um, on Merian, but I'd just like to conclude um, with this, um, that for the Labadist, hymnody uh, was a way to express this spirituality, and you can see it uh, not only in hymns, but also in the plates of Marianne. 
um, it was kind of a creative synthesis of a Catholic uh, and Reformed uh, influence. Uh, it's quite beyond the, the boundaries uh, of established and national uh, churches as they tried to uh, form uh, this new uh, community that was uh, gathering the elect uh, for the coming of Christ. So we don't know the identity of many of the authors of the, the Labadist hymns that we have in Heilige Gesangen and the original French uh, hymns. Um, but we can, um, we can identify that they are from very diff they are, they have diff showing different genres, different styles. Um, they have also different approaches to poetry and, and hymnody. Some are more theological, some are more didactic. Some uh, are pure, um, more uh, contemplative, some are quite merry and joyful. Um, we know also from other accounts that the authors were both men and women. Uh, Schurman was herself a poet, and uh, poems are included in Heilige um, Zange. And some of the hymns, like this one, the Chanson de la Lessive, were also associated with uh, very precise uh, tasks. Um, so they were, the hymns were really accompanying uh, the life of the community. Some of the transatlantic journeys to Suriname um, gave um, birth to some hymns. Uh, Thanksgiving, the de fame, like death of uh, uh, leaders in the community, uh, or a plague, uh, or menial tasks like this. So the hymns were a way to gather the community, uh, different generations, different voices, uh, in both languages and also on both continents, because the Labadist hymnals was used on both sides of the Atlantic and North and South America when they uh, settled uh, their communities there. Um, <clears throat> so the, the Labadist hymnals were also a way of really, really like binding it, and you can s binding the community, and you can see it with this lovely um, uh, book. Um, that's um, actually the Eilere Rezang, and you see the different pages that are almost falling uh, apart. Uh, but it gave an idea of, of what the Labadist community was and how they also disbanded uh, at the end um, because of the passing of time and the change in their uh, yearning and expectations. Um, so the community really disbanded between the 1690s and 1720s. Um, these hymns, as a matter of fact, fell out of use when the community disappeared, uh, although some of them existed in translation in German. Uh, so it is quite thrilling at Saint-Esprit to be able to, uh, to revive and sing together these hymns again uh, in a place uh, where, they, where they were uh, once sung some 300 years ago. So I'm now going to let Aya introduce her, us to the music uh, more in details of the Labadist and see uh, how this is um, telling us more about them too. Thank you, Aya, and thank you all of you. Thank you, Jolice. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about their music and also uh, how I prepare the score for us to sing and perform. So we had the pleasure of introducing some of the Labadist hymns to you this morning. And we picked four hymns for this occasion. And I hope you all had a chance to enjoy singing and listening. So here uh, I will talk about, first, we will look at about the early music printing and how the sheet music was printed that time. Secondly, I will show you how I transcribe the music to a more accessible format so that we can sing and perform comfortably. And at last, my overall musical remarks and observations about their hymns. So this is how it started. Last year, Joris showed me a facsimile of a 17th century music manuscript. And he explained to me that it was a collection of the hymns used in the Lavadist community. And they look like this. 
The music is written in one of the historical notations, and it was printed by using the movable type. So it looks a bit different from the sheet music in our time. At the beginning of the hymn collection, it says that let his star the whole hand gesangen, not order for the alphabet by the Zalman David of Welke and Geboden Gesongen. Register of the proceeding songs on the order of the alphabet, or in the Psalms of David to which some are sung. So the hymns are listed in alphabetical order of the text in the collection. Before we look at those hymns closely, I would like to show you about the music printing process that time. Movable type printing is a process of printing music developed in the 16th century, and it features the system using movable pieces of type. Music notation is usually more complicated than text. You need stuff lines, notes, rests, dots, in addition to words for text. So setting up a page of music type involved assembling lots of little blocks. Here in this picture, you see one of the music types used that time. It is a Gohon music set, which was used to print choir books in the 16th and the 17th centuries in Antwerp, which are now preserved in the Plantin Lattes Museum there in Antwerp. To explain how they did it, I will show you a brief video which was filmed at the Plantin Lattes Museum. The video is about 10 minutes long, and you can watch the complete clip on YouTube, but I edited for a shorter version, so here it is. Here at the Plantin Moretus Museum in Antwerp, we have some preserved examples of 16th century music type, and we can see how the printed music was literally put together. For each note, you would need a separate piece of type. Here's one with the note head on the middle line of the stave. If you wanted to build an ascending scale, you would go from there to one with a piece of type on the next space, and then on the next line up, and the next space, and on the top line. You could save the number of pieces of type by turning it the other way up, and so now we have the ascending scale of all the notes from the bottom line up to the middle line. So this is how they printed music. 
As you also see in this picture, individual blocks of musical notes and alphabets were lined up in a row and they locked together, placed in a printing press, inked, and at last placed onto paper. Next, I would like to talk about very briefly how you read the historical notation used here and how you transcribe it to the modern notation. This is the original manuscript of the Sanctus, which we sang this morning. And as I said earlier, the music looks a bit different from the notation we are familiar with. In the original manuscript, the C clef is used instead of G clef, treble clef. It means middle C is located at the middle line of the clef. So in this case, the first note is G, sol. And also the names of notes are different. They are called longa, blavi, semi-blavi, minim, semi-minim, and fusa. And the rest signs look like a scribble, but each of them corresponds to the duration of the notes. So we see three rests in this music. And these are rest for a semi-minimum. There are also other signs which are not used any longer in the modern notation, such as custos and sinum congruentiae. So you need to consider those aspects when you look at the historical notation. And I will show you a transcription I made, which is a version in modern notation. This is one of the transcriptions I made. This is a song called Dunhill Love to Hear, and Joe plays is a load. That Cynthia sang beautifully this morning, and Joyce explained the poem earlier in the presentation. So what I did to create a transcription is that, first, I used a modern score layout, used modernized choice of clef and notation, and added bar lines where necessary. That means all the notes of the melody are set on the G clef, treble clef and the series of eighth notes are beamed together. Like these are eighth notes are beamed in the modern notation so that it looks easier to read. Only one Dutch verse is written in the original manuscript. So I added under the notes, French text, which Joris found in the separate printed hymnals uh, that he also explained in the earlier slides. And we still don't know yet about the original performance practice in the Lavadis community, like how they were performed or sung in the community at that time. So for today's occasion, I created a bass line and some accompaniment as you heard this morning. In this music, I just wrote down the bass line and by following one of the performance practices of the 17th century called Basso Continuo, I improvise and play the accompaniment part based on those bass lines. So this is how I made a performing edition from the original manuscript so that we can actually perform by using this score. So let's listen how it sounds.
Next, I would like to take a closer look at this hem and see if there are any characteristics about this hem. This applies to actually all the Labadist hems in the collection, but let's start with a style of the hem. The texture is monophonic. It has a single and accompanied melodic line. And it is also strophic. That means all verses are sung to the same music. And syllabic, which is one syllable is set to each note. When one syllable is assigned to two or more notes, the notes are joined by slurs, like here and here and here. And that means one syllable is elongated for two or more notes. I also like to point out that in this hymn, there is a beautifully executed technique called word painting. Word painting is a musical depiction of words in text. So one melodic gesture actually reflects, illustrate, or imply the meaning of the words. For example, fuxt, midden, beneden, that is highest, middle, and under. And if you look at the music, for the word highest is here, they are in the high range, and the figure is actually going up. It's da da na na na. It's going up. And for the middle, for the word midden, they are right in the middle range in the song. And for the down is here, the note is actually going down as da, 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 da. And longer notes are generally assigned to show strong words and syllables. In this case, here, load, and ear, that's owner. And here is here, and ear is here. And they are set on the long note. Another example is Angel for Hell. Joyce mentioned them earlier also, but it's angel, angel and bird. And they reflect mirrored images in the music. They move with the same interval perfect force, ascending on the word angel and descending on the word bird. And I think they illustrate their images beautifully. Also, their words like lift, love, zut, sweet, melody, and zingen, that sing, and each of them shows melodious gestures in the music, like here, as a very melodious motif in the music. So I will play the music again, and I hope you will enjoy some details of the music. So, how about the other hymns in the collection? There are 48 hymns in this collection, 
and I have started to make a catalog and written down contents and forms of each hem and any characteristics and compositional remarks. We still don't know yet if some of them are their original compositions. That means any members of the Labadist community actually composed. So far, I had a success in identifying a hymn tune for only three of them, which are two very well-known hymn tunes, Honde Adu, uh, which is actually the last hymn we sang this morning, and in Duchi Jubilo. And also, I found a matching tune in the collection of old and new Dutch peasant songs and country dances, which was published in Amsterdam at the beginning of the 18th century. And actually, it contains 996 songs, and I checked them all, and I found one matching tune. The compositional style and character of those hymns show a great deal of variety. They are composed in numbers of different keys, both major and minor keys, and some are composed in an old church mode, such as Dorian, Phlegian, Lydian, which is a system of pitch organization used in a Gregorian chant. They are, they are in a different meter, duple or triple meters. Some of them are long, some are short. Some of them are more in the straightforward form and in the clear structure with four bar phrases and with simple moving rhythm. On the other hand, some have quite a few quick rhythmical figures and an an unexpected progressions. And I want to show you two hymns to compare some contrasting elements. The first one is this. It is one of the longest hymns and consists of 67 measures long of notation. Let's listen first how it sounds. It continues a bit further, but I stop at the halfway now. As you might already notice, the notation looks very white. That means they are used only long note values, such as semi brevi and minim, that is modern equivalent of whole notes and half notes. And it is in the style of ancient plain chant. It means the melody goes with a free flowing pulse with no actual regular metric accent. And it moves smoothly and mostly with stepwise motion. On the other hand, the second one sounds very different from the first one. So let's listen. There are only eight measures, and with two sections of music, with each section repeated. 
Also in here, only short note values, fuza and semifuza, eighth and sixteenth notes in modern notation are used. And the range of the melody is relatively very high, going up to even high G in here. And also the remarkable thing is that that the use of rhythmic movements, such as dotted rhythm, syncopations, as well as several leaps in the melody. As you see in this, there's a leap of fifth, and this is leaping down. And also chromatic progressions. That means the melody moves chromatically from like C sharp to C natural. All of the features are not C in the first hymn. And just looking, these two hymns explain how diverse and varied those Lavadist hymns are. So these were what I remarked in observing the original manuscript of the Lavadist hymns. And we love to know what you think of the music and then how you like the hymns we sang this morning. If you have any questions, we would love to, we'd be delighted to answer them too. So we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. And if you watch this live, please join us for the Zoom discussion starting right after this. You will find the Zoom link in the bulletin on the first page of our website. Thank you very much for joining us. Merci à Joyce. Merci beaucoup Aya. Thank you well. Et merci à tous. Merci à tous. <laughs>